It's Wednesday, and on behalf of Tri-State Livestock News, The Fence Post, and Farm and Rancher Exchange, I'm Sam Tenpenny, back with more Fair Cattle Markets daily headlines. Tri-State Livestock News reported that several factors have impacted the strong cattle market in recent weeks. Commodity broker Dennis Smith of Archer Financial Services says that he's seen three recent outside factors impacting live cattle prices, in addition to packer activity that is likely contributing to the price dip. Smith says that packers' purpose, purposeful slowing of chain speed, along with the fire outside of National Beef Packing Plant, Record placements reported in USDA's on-feed report and the avian influenza news have all affected live cattle prices lately. Smith said reports show that the big four packers usually slaughter cattle on Saturdays, but they have slowed or stopped their Saturday kill in an effort to back up supply, which reduces supply on the retail end, but also adds weight to the slaughter-ready cattle, which can allow the packers to discount feeders for heavier carcasses, activity that Smith believes has been going on for a matter of weeks. Dan Cahoy, who owns several South Dakota grocery stores, says that he sources meat from smaller independent meat packers and that he too has seen a slight price increase of about 10% in the past week, but not a huge jump in beef prices as the result of higher cattle prices, commenting that he doesn't know that beef prices even coincide with cattle prices. Corey Hart of Chasley, North Dakota, sold a load of cattle last week and concurs with Smith's take after seeing the price drop about $3 per hundredweight immediately following the news of avian flu being detected in dairy cattle, which he translates to about $1,000 less on a load of cattle. Hart has more cattle ready for slaughter, and he's concerned that if he does wait for the market to correct itself after the recent disruptions, that his cattle will be overfed by then, and he will be forced to take discounts. As he said, it's a catch-22. Several months ago, the big packers reported to feeders that they would allow carcass weights to be a little bit heavier before imposing discounts, which Hart believes is due to short supplies and extra meat being needed in the industry. But winter storms and cold in South Dakota and Nebraska have held carcass weights a little bit lower than what were expected, which added to the price increase in February and March, which likely also cause the packers to want to slow the chain speed. In addition to the reduction of slaughter numbers, Hart agrees the highly pathogen avian influenza H5N1 news of late has also impacted prices more than it should have, commenting that he believes the story has been overdone. Hart, who has met several times in the past two years with USDA packers and stockyards agency staff, said that the act needs to be updated in the farm bill with new rules that limit packer ownership of cattle, which will require the big packers to bid more aggressively on independently owned cattle, as he believes the packers own more cattle now than they ever have before. Kansas Livestock Association CEO Matt Teagarden said that the fire outside of the National Beef Plant in Liberal, Kansas, also impacted harvest for a few days as the beef in coolers was affected by smoke. And in order to assess and properly handle the smoke-affected beef, that the plants had to halt slaughter for a time. Teagarden also identified that the avian influenza situation has indeed caused market uncertainty, but he remains optimistic about opportunities in the cattle industry in the coming months. Teagarden does want to clarify that, based on his understanding, the avian flu is not being spread cow to cow, but rather passed on via mechanical transfer, such as through a milking machine, most likely. Particularly, he wants to emphasize that it is unlikely that the disease is transmitted from human to human or mammal to mammal contact at all, and it appears that in extremely rare cases of humans being affected that they have been exposed to animals with the disease, whether those be dead or alive. Western Ag Reporter commented that the primary effect being seen by producers is the significant loss in production, but there's also the unknown of will these cows come back to the level that they were before after they recover? Although there has been no indication thus far, an obvious concern for the industry is the risk of HPAI in beef cattle. Although beef cattle are not managed the same as dairy cattle and they're not under the same stress of being milked every day, producers are still being urged to keep an intense eye and monitor their herds at this time, considering the challenge for beef cattle is not catching the infection in a timely manner as we're not quantitatively measuring their milk supply and quality, which has allowed the dairy industry to catch the infection so quickly. According to TSLN, Tea Garden acknowledged the cattle market certainly has faltered from the high water mark of two or three weeks ago, but reiterated that all signs do point to this not being a spread and that he remains optimistic about the market. DTN also reported that despite all of this, beef demand should remain strong as feeder cattle supplies are still thin. The Northern Plains receive moisture, which should ease some drought concerns in the region, and that there are no indications that replacement heifers are being kept back to regrow the U.S. cow herd. DTN livestock analyst Shaley Stewart commented that she would be more understanding of the market's meltdown, if dairy cattle were having to be euthanized, or if the infected cattle were sloughing calves, or if the flu posed any risk to consumers, but that's simply not the case. According to the Hagstrom Report, the National Pork Producers Council are praising Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack for his support of the industry at a roundtable discussion in Mankato, Minnesota last week. In its weekly newspaper, NPPC said that Vilsack's announcement of the availability of $1.5 billion in the Regional Conservation Partnership Program 
will help agriculture producers advance conservation and climate smart practices. The group also noted that the MPPC president participated in the roundtable discussion and that they pointed out that USDA had purchased about 105 million in pork products for food programs in the past year and that at the roundtable, Vilsack repeated previous comments that he believes California Prop 12, which bans the sale of pork produced anywhere that doesn't meet the state's animal housing standards, will cause chaos in the marketplace and that he supports a congressional fix to it. NPPC commended Bill Sack, hoping that lending his voice would make Congress pay attention and come up with a federal solution through the Farm Bill, but they also credited the Biden-Harris administration's USDA with working on market access issues, including ensuring China lives up to its international commitments to science-based standards and having engaged in the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's proposed permitting guidelines for meatpacking plants, which, if adopted as written, could shut down 76 or more facilities. The NPPC has also said that USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service has worked with the U.S. pork industry to ensure sufficient harvest capacity at packing plants, including implementing a pilot program that allows faster processing line speeds at facilities. Drovers announced the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and Public Lands Council condemned the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's indication that they intend to proceed with translocating grizzly bears to the North Cascades ecosystem in northwest Washington state, despite longstanding and vocal objections from local communities and elected officials. The final environmental impact statement released last month is not a final decision, but indicates that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services is likely to translocate bears to the area with the Section 10J rule under the Endangered Species Act in place with the goal of eventually reaching a stable population of 200 head. A final decision is expected in the coming weeks. Director of PLC and NCBA Government Affairs Sigurd Johannes said that dropping new apex predators into rural Americans' backyards is not something that the federal government should undertake without census. State and local stakeholders have made their serious concerns about the proposal known for years now and that plowing forward to the detriment of local farmers and ranchers would be unwise for both conservation of the species and the health of the rural economy. We urge the administration to listen to local communities and to reconsider the plan. That's all for now. I'm Sam Tenpenny with Tri-State Livestock News, The Fence Post, and Farmer and Rancher Exchange. Tune in next week for more Fair Cattle Markets Daily Headlines.